Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> well, it's the 1st of November. The nights are drawing in. We've changed the clocks. It's stormy and rainy and cold. But we're here as a lot of people this morning, Max, uh, for uh, the last time for a month. Um, I think it's looking like um, places of worship won't be open for the next month. So we're going to value this time together. We're thankful for the Lord that we can be here. Um, we do pray that he would bless this time that we spend together. So let's start off this morning. We were going to have an MP3 recording, but um, the technology doesn't want to doesn't want to comply with our wishes, so Christy stepped in. Um, I think we've got the words. Christy, are you going to just play the tune for us while um, John is going to come up and sing? Um, has everyone got the words? Copy of the words? Yep. Okay. There are some extra copies uh, that are printed out. Um, they haven't been touched by human hand. I might run out of puff on the praise and praise, and so you can all hope. <laughs> Good, that's good, thank you. and pray for us. Pray that they might know your presence with them this morning. Father, we come to you. Uh, we come in these troubled times 
and we're thankful that we can indeed praise you, that you are the God of changing, uh, the God who put this earth into its orbit around the sun, uh, that brings about uh, day and night, season after season. And we're in a strange season now, Father, we would come to you. Uh, we do pray for your help in these times, and we do pray for your help in our country, and we do pray for our, your help in our personal lives. As we spend time together this morning, we pray that you might bless us, that you might be with us, that you would give us open hearts and minds as we think about your word, as we, as we hear songs sung or sing songs, even <clears throat> just in our minds or in the quietness of just speaking to ourselves. We can pray that our hearts would indeed truly worship you because we worship in spirit and in truth. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that in him we have forgiveness for our sins. And that we come to you this morning not standing in our own righteousness, but completely and solely and wholly dependent upon what he's done for us. We know that we're sinners. We know that even... In the, uh, the brief time that we've been awake and alive this day, our thoughts have fallen short of your glory, but we don't think of you were right, that even in the best things that we do, uh, we're, we're still falling short of your holy standard. So we come to you this morning, our Father, as sinners, uh, sinners who, um, if we stood before you in our own goodness, would be facing the wrath of a holy God, and yet we stand before you in Jesus. We come to you confident because we come covered by his blood, covered in his righteousness. We come depending upon him, trusting our Lord Jesus. We thank you for that work that the Lord Jesus did on the cross for us. <coughs> when he shed his blood, his blood was shed for the remission of our sins, and as we... <coughs> Repent and turn from our sin, and as we put our trust in the Lord Jesus, then indeed we are made righteous in Him. We have our sins taken away, our guilt taken away. We have that hope of eternal life given to us. We have the Holy Spirit given to us as a gift, and we thank you for all these precious things, Lord. And that as we come together as believers this morning, we are coming together not just as a a small number of, of people in <coughs> this village hall in Brailsford, but we come as part of a huge eternal gathering, that great cloud of witnesses, that great host of heaven that are praising you. And we thank you, Father, that as we think about these things, we're lifted out of our, our present circumstances and into the very holy of holies, into that, into heaven itself. So, Father, we come with these thoughts in our minds, Reminding us of all that you've done for us, uh, giving us that joy and thankfulness. And we do pray that you might bless us this morning and encourage us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> now, I've got a, a very short children's item this morning. Um, when we were in <coughs> Boys Brigade a couple of weeks ago, uh, we did a memory verse with the children. But I think it's a memory verse that. You probably all know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the reference. And if anyone can put up their hand and very quietly tell me what the verse is that goes with it, and see if anybody knows it. Is that hard, Elijah? Yeah? Is that hard? Is that hard, Elliot? Yeah, it is. Okay. But we'll still also see if any of the others. Let's, let's give <coughs> the children a chance first. Here's the, here's the verse reference. Proverbs chapter, five, chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Does anyone think they might know that? John thinks he knows it. I think it's that. Any? <laughs> Anybody else? Shall I give you a clue? It starts off trust. Oh, oh. There's a few more hands up now. Jill, yes, okay, Felicity, all right, okay. Shall we all try and say it? I'm going to say it, and let's see if you got it right. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, 
and he will make your path straight. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Who got it right? Anybody get it right? The words might have changed because I was, I was using one of the Bibles that we use in church for the, the Boys Brigade. So let's see if we can learn that. So trust him. Has anyone got any good actions? I think Felicity was showing us some actions. Who showed us some actions? So with a heart, What's a, what would be a good action for trust? Does anyone know what a good action for trust? Holding on to a rope. Holding on to a rope. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, any other ideas? I like, I like the rope. Jill, Jill was doing a, what, what was that, a capital T? Yeah, the rope. Oh, the rope, okay. Yeah, because you have to trust the rope. Okay, we'll do that. So trust in the Lord with the rope. With all, I always do a big round, that's like everything, all your <coughs> heart, okay, and lean, not on your own as well, I think leaning, if you have a pair of crutches, you have to lean on them as you go along, don't you, but you can make up just, you can just have a <coughs> thing to lean on, or something like that, anyone else got any good, good ideas for lean, a lean walking stick or a pair of crutches, does anyone have to have a pair of crutches ever? Jill has, yeah, and John. Hard work, isn't it? <laughs> but you need them if your legs don't work right. <coughs> Not on your own understanding. What would be a good, a good action for understanding? Understanding. Some, 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 our understanding's in there, I think, isn't it? For most people, anyway. Is that right? <laughs> Maybe not our own understanding. In all your ways. How about ways? What's a good one? <coughs> That's a good way. <coughs> How about, yeah, person walking along? That's our way, so when we're walking. Submit to him, so we'll just, we'll just point up, we'll just say, submit to him, submit to the Lord. And he will make your paths straight. Okay. Right, let's all try and put that together. What was trust on it? Trust with the road, yes, okay. Trust in the Lord. <coughs> With all <coughs> your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I think that's quite an easy reference to remember because you can remember. 3, 4, 5, and 6, but it's not 4. So it's Proverbs 3, not 4, 5, and 6. that work? Okay. You know what? John. Could I give you a practical historical demonstration? Okay. Yes. So we had a young man at a boys' brigade camp who fancied this other young woman at boys' brigade camp. They were both Christians. And when I discovered and worked on a third week into this love affair that was in this person's head, he asked me what my advice would be. And I said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not onto your own understanding and always acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And along with the church and everyone else praying for this couple, in fact, I think we got to the point where the pastor asked us not to pray anymore, uh, inadvisably. The young man in question, Andy Blower, asked me if I would read that a passage of scripture at his wedding. And I said, what would you want me to read? And he said, the verses that you gave me last year. So there you go, that's the practical <laughs> application. It all, all went really well after that, swimmingly. You know, I, I think also this would be a good verse to remember when we're praying for our government, wouldn't mm. it? But they would trust in the Lord with all of their hearts and lean not just on their own understanding, but in all their ways submit to him and they <coughs> will make their path straight. So we can remember that when we're praying for other people and we can claim it for ourselves and then be careful to do it. Okay, let's just have a quick word of prayer and think about that. Father, we thank you for this verse. We thank you for those practical applications that even in our lives we can do this and you will bring that verse to pass for us. We will pray for our government this morning that our Prime Minister and uh, the members of the government would trust 
in you with all of their hearts and lean not on their own understanding, but they indeed would submit to him in all of their ways and you would make their path straight according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Felicity's got a couple of um, worship songs for us, Felicity. Could I ask Felicity to do two of these? Then we've got Glenn to come up and do the, the reading and a prayer, and then we do the third one after. Is that yep. all right? Okay. Um, so just quite a song, so if you wanted to follow the words of the choir, if you just wanted to <coughs> privately behind the face mask and have some time, we're just listening to God while I play. <laughs> This reading is taken from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. The model prayer. There it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. A friend comes at midnight. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from the and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Keep asking, seeking, and knocking. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, we acknowledge you as the creator of all good things, 
the greater of heaven and earth. Lord, you are a great and mighty God, and hallowed be your name. <coughs> Lord, we thank you that we can bring our prayers and petitions this morning to you, our Heavenly Father, through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, of which you exalted from the grave, who is seated at your right hand, and who is interceding for us day by day. Lord, we claim a promise this morning where if two or three are gathered, you are in our midst. Lord, we ask for protection this day from the evil one. Lord, we acknowledge that we find ourselves yet again in difficult circumstances. We face another lockdown. But Lord, we are not locked down in you because we have access to you day by day. And Lord, we would claim a promise that your word may be heard and your word may be blessed this day. Lord, we thank you for your pastors and ministers throughout this land who are preaching your word today. Lord, may you inspire them by the power of your Holy Spirit to preach the words which the people of this land need to hear. Lord, there are many people who are lost. They do not know which way to turn. But we thank you that you have directed our paths. You have kept us sure and steadfast on your word. And Lord, we would long, not only for ourselves, for our families, our loved ones, that there may be great rejoicing of sinners being saved this day from the hearing and reading of your word. Lord, we acknowledge that your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was tempted in the wilderness, pointed to your word to say, it is written. And Lord, we would long for people to pick up your word, to read it, to hear it, and uh, rejoice. Lord, we do thank you for our church and our church family. Lord, we ask a blessing and pray for those who are not with us this day, whether it is through uh, illness or circumstance. Lord, be all to them which they need this day. May you draw alongside them and give them the assurance uh, they need, that they may be restored and returned to us. Lord, we um, pray for our schools at this time, as they will be returning from the um, half-term break. May you protect our young people as they uh, go to their classes and uh, education. May you give wisdom and guidance to the school leaders and teachers in the conducting of the lessons. Lord, we do pray for our youth work of the church. May you sustain it and bless it, even though again we are facing uh, a lockdown for a month or so. Um, help the children remember uh, the words the verses which they've learned over these past few weeks. It's been a great joy to have them back at the Empire Hall. And we just ask that you may bless their young lives and inspire their parents and encourage them to keep sending them along <coughs> when they can. Lord, we thank you above all this morning for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that great gift to us, that ultimate sacrifice for us to save each one of us uh, from our sins and in his name i pray amen
Thank you very much, Felicity. They were beautiful songs. Thank you, Glyn, for the reading and the prayer. Just uh, come to God's Word. So we think about a portion of Scripture. Let's just bow our heads again. <coughs> Father, we thank you for those thoughts that your Spirit is like water to our souls, bringing that refreshment and blessing when the Word is like a, a lamp to our feet and we do pray for that this morning Uh, from this world we don't get refreshment for our souls so lord we look to your word we look to your holy spirit to bring us that refreshment and blessing and that your word might indeed light our way be a lamp unto our feet we pray in jesus name amen we're looking at this passage in luke chapter 11 this morning there were some uh, little Fairly simple worksheets for children. Yeah, good, okay. I did preach this last week on Zoom at Steep Turnpike, so it's a sort of eco-friendly sermon this morning, recycled and reused, um, but probably not reduced. Um, A little bit reduced, maybe. (laughs) Let me start by asking a question. Um, You don't have to answer the question, just about think about the answer in your own in your own minds. So here's the first question. Does anyone here think that they're good at prayer? Does anyone here think that they're good at prayer? You know, if I, if I think, if, if we did have a show of hands, I wonder if anyone would be brave enough or brash enough to put their hand up. My guess is probably not. Because even if you've been a Christian for years, and you've been praying for years, I think we all have that sense that we're not really very good at it. There's always a lot more to learn. So here's the next question. If you saw an advert, you saw an advert, would you be interested if the advert went went like this? Coming soon, seminar. Seminar title, how to pray. Seminar leader, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, that would be something, wouldn't it? I'd sign up for that. You'd, You'd have queues outside the door. The internet ticketing system would be sold out in minutes. But that's exactly what we have in our passage this morning. How exciting is that a seminar on how to pray led by the Lord Jesus Christ, (coughs) reported to us by an eyewitness, someone who was there at the time, one of the apostles. So here is our exciting and our same time daunting task today to learn how to pray taught by the Lord Jesus. I can't think of anything more important for us, or indeed, more important for anybody. So we've got, I think it's 13 verses today. They divide up into four paragraphs. Not quite sure what it looks like in your Bible, but verses 1 to 4, we've got what we call the Lord's Prayer, what we might call the pattern of prayer. Then verses 5 to 8, that story of going to a friend in the middle of the night, persisting in prayer. Then verses 9 and 10, asking, seeking and knocking, the simplicity of prayer. And then verses uh, 11 to 13, the story of the father and the snake, expectancy and confidence (coughs) in prayer. (coughs) Now, there's an awful lot to draw out of this passage, so I'm not going to cover all of that this morning. We'll see how far we get. But I'm probably going to just cover on the first point, to to concentrate on the first point, the Lord's Prayer. Um, And probably not get through much more than that at the moment. So let's have a look at this version of the Lord's Prayer. The disciples have come to Jesus and asked him, teach us to pray. And he gives them just this short prayer, which we call the Lord's Prayer. The commonest form is probably the form that's in Matthew chapter 6. And that has six phrases or petitions. Luke's version is missing the phrase, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I think in some versions also it's missing that end phrase, deliver us from evil. So it just has five petitions or phrases. And again, I'm going to ask questions to help us think through these points. And I have to say that the Lord's Prayer is probably my favourite topic for preaching. I've preached on it a few times. It always challenges me. I always learn something new. So how do we start? Jesus said to them, so when you pray, say, 
our Father in heaven. Say, Father. It would be easy to skip over this, wouldn't it? It's so familiar to us, so familiar. It's almost meaningless. We just, oh, boom, it comes out automatically said without much thought. But that one word, Father, is the most meaningful. So here's my question that goes with this. What am I? What am I? And that comes to this vexed question of what we call nowadays identity. It's everywhere, isn't it? Identity politics, self-identification. It's all about not what you are, but what you identify as. And the answer that the Lord Jesus Christ gives us in this prayer is that we are children of the Father. That's how we are to consciously approach God. But what does that mean? What does it mean when we say we're children of the Father? There's a sense in which everyone is a child of God. And you do find that used in the Bible. It's in Malachi chapter 2 and verse 10. It says this, Do we not all have one Father? Did not one God create us? So it's used in the sense that the Father means creator. But is that the sense in which it's being used here? Can anyone, anyone in the whole world, whether they're Muslim, Hindu, Jew, Christian, Buddhist, agnostic, atheist, can they all approach God and call him Father? And the answer to that, of course, is no. Jesus is doing something very radical here. A Jew would never call God Father. That would be blasphemy. It would be heresy. And John chapter 5 verse 18 says, For this reason they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. And when the Jews heard that, they picked up stones to stone him. It was so blasphemous. Jews wouldn't even say the name of God. Even today, devout Jews will write G and then a little underscore or a hyphen D. They won't even write the word God. But then even more shocking, Jesus spells it out for the Pharisees and, and for us in John chapter 8. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, those ultra-religious teachers of the law, and he says this, you're doing the works of your father. They say, we're not illegitimate children, they protested. The only <coughs> father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I'm not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. Now remember, Jesus is saying this to people who would have considered themselves the chosen people of God. Even more so, the Pharisees would have seen themselves as not just the chosen, but the chosen of the chosen. Right up there, the people who were closest to God. So when Jesus talks like this to the Pharisees, it's really shocking. Now Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote quite a lot of all those letters in the New Testament, he was a Pharisee. And he testified that it took a work of God's grace to change him, to take him from being an enemy of God to being a child of God. The Bible has lots of different ways of describing this, this radical change. In John chapter 3, John, Jesus told another Pharisee, Nicodemus, that no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he's born again. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, we were by nature objects of wrath, not pleasing to God, but his enemies. And he says that we were dead in our sins, but then when we became Christians, we were made alive. The difference between death and life. In Colossians, Paul says that God rescued us from the rule or the dominion of darkness and brought us into the rule of the kingdom of the Son that he loves. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says that when we become Christians, we receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which he calls the Spirit of Sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now that word, Abba, which you find 
in the New Testament in a, two or three places, it's not actually a Swedish word. It's the Aramaic word for father. It's the word that Jesus and the disciples and all those listening to him would have used for their own father. It's quite possible for anyone to pray the Lord's Prayer and for anyone to say father. But this prayer is the family prayer for those who've become Christians, who've undergone this radical transformation by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, who've been born again, who've been made alive, who've received the Spirit and by him cry, Abba, Father. I wonder if you're here today, listening today. Can I gently ask you, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you experienced the work of God's transforming grace in your heart and your mind and your life? The joy of sins forgiven, guilt taken away, that dread fear of death removed, replaced by the hope, the sure and certain hope of, of, of eternal life, of heaven. Have you had that ache, that despair of the meaningless of life taken away? It's quite fashionable in these days to be an atheist. But ultimately atheism is believing that nothing created everything for no reason. As Richard Dawkins says, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. No hope, no right or wrong. You see, in the atheist worldview, any hope and reason we might have is just a sort of faking it, a construct, a, a make-believe, acting to enable us to, to get by and get along. But that doesn't work. It doesn't satisfy and it doesn't match up with our own experience of reality. That there is value. That there is meaning and morality and more than material. And in this one word, Father, Jesus offers us hope. In fact, it's an extraordinary, extravagant, unexpected, ridiculous promise. The superlatives fail and fall short. What is he saying? The God of Genesis who created the universe. How many? I think at the last count it was, it was getting into the, the, the hundreds of billions of galaxies. Each galaxy with a billion stars, it's unimaginable. The scientists say more than the, the number of grains of sand on all the beaches in this world, that's the number of stars. And there's plenty we don't know about yet. Who formed the atmosphere to give us amazing sunrises Sunsets, cloudscapes that, that leave us amazed and inspired. I was up at Carsington last night just watching the sun go down and just light up the sky. And we can see that not quite on a daily basis, but nearly. This God who put the dots on the ladybird, who put the spots on the leopard, who put the stripes on the hyena, on the zebra, who knows the number of hairs on your head, the word on your tongue before you speak who knows the DNA code of you and your father and mother and your grandfathers and grandmothers back through the generations. This God before whom one day we will give account for every careless word. That we can come before this God and call him Father. The wonder of it. Just take a moment to try and grasp that. Not Father as in Creator, but Father, as in a real relationship, a member of the family, a child of God. Paul writes to the Galatians in, in chapter 4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. <coughs> might receive adoption to sonship. We're brought into the family. Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, there it is again. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. To use this word on our own authority, to call God Father on our own authority, that would be presumptuous. It would be an act of disrespect, of blasphemy. And that's exactly what the Jews said about Jesus. Yet this is what Jesus commands 
us to do. When you pray, say, Father. That's our authority. We do it on his authority. We do it because he has made this possible for us. Paid the price on the cross. Blood shed that our sins might be forgiven. So that God sees us not as objects of wrath, as enemies, but as members of his family, bought with the precious blood of his son. Not just tolerated as we come into his prison, but given a, a rich welcome as we grasp these truths. At the very start of this prayer, then everything else in this passage becomes makes sense, it becomes clear. It's the key that turns the lock and opens the door. If you get this, then you get it all. If you miss this, you miss it all. I hadn't expended, intended to spend so long on this point, but we can just look briefly now through these other petitions and phrases and the parts of this passage with this, this sort of basis in mind, through this, this lens, as it were. Everything falls into place. And the title of uh, our, our sermon this morning was Powerful Prayer. Perhaps I should retitle that. It's the astounding miracle, the ridiculous, breathtaking audacity of that one word, Father. But let's just go back and think about that title for a moment. How can we do powerful prayer? We've all admitted, I think, that we're not very good at praying. We do our best, but we fall short. So how can we aspire to powerful praying? Isn't that unrealistic? Unattainable, a, a sort of mirage that will always be out of reach. No, it's for this very re reason, that one word, Father. It's not about who we are in ourselves, our identity. It's not about our standing before God in our own right. It's about who we stand in, who we stand in before God. We stand in Jesus. It's his standing that we stand in. I'm sort of playing about with that, those words standing and stand in. We stand in Jesus and it's his standing before God that makes our prayers powerful. It's, it's by his right that makes our prayers powerful. I think there's a chorus that says it's all about Jesus. Yes, that's absolutely right. It's spot on got it right. When we're in Jesus, Jesus <coughs> takes our prayers and he prays them alongside us, those weak and feeble and probably mistaken prayers some of the times, and he presents them to his Father, holy and perfect and acceptable. That's our powerful praying. Isn't that a great encouragement for us when we pray? Paul says in Romans chapter 8, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, He's at the right hand of God and he's also interceding for us. He's praying for us. And that's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. Again from Romans chapter 8. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Perhaps as a Christian, you're uncertain about prayer. You may be young. You may not be fluent. You may not have all the right words or theology. None of that matters if you're born again, if you're standing in Jesus and able to say, Father. So let's turn to the rest of this prayer and this passage and apply what we've learnt. I'm not really going to go through it very thoroughly, sort of exhaustively. We'd be here quite a long time. So I'm just going to concentrate on this, this first petition. Each of these phrases is worth really studying diligently and thinking through. But let's just look at this, uh, these phrases fairly briefly. So we've got this first phrase, haven't we? Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. The word hallowed means to make holy, to sanctify, to set apart, as special, to set apart from the common. Now, a few years ago, the laws on Sunday trading were changing, and there was a campaign to, it's called to keep Sunday special, to keep it set apart as a day which is different to the other days of the week. And that's what we're praying for here, that 
God's name would be kept special. And when we say name, we don't just mean the label that we use for God. It, it's, it means the whole person, our whole thinking about God, that we're praying that God's name and his person would be kept special. And this is not an airy, fairy, so heavenly minded, it's no earthly use kind of prayer. Because our prayer life can't be separated from the other parts of our lives, our home life, our work life, our social life, our social media life, our relaxing life, our entertainment life. We must be consistent in our praying and our living. Otherwise, we're just hypocrites like those Pharisees. So when we pray for God's name and person to be kept special, to be kept set apart, we're praying that we would keep it special and set apart. We're praying that it would be kept special and set apart by us in our speech, our thoughts, our lives, by the churches that we attend, by our neighbours and our friends and the society that we live in. But in our lives that we would promote and work for the setting apart, the specialness of God's name in all of these places. What a challenge that is for us, isn't it? When there's so much casual blasphemy all around us, how we need to pray this. Now, we might say that when we pray, we reveal what's most important to us, our anxieties, our hopes, our attitudes. So in giving us this prayer, Jesus is giving us an insight into what our attitudes and our concerns should be as Christians, as children of the living God. So what's top of the list in our praying? Just have a think about that. When we pray, what do we put first in our praying? What's our primary concern? What's in the number one spot? Hallowed be your name. Is that in our number one spot? Praying that God's name and God's person is kept special. And in the context of being members of the family, of this being our family name, our father's name, our brother Jesus' name, this is personal, isn't it? This is something which concerns us as Christians. So what about the second concern? Have we got on to asking for the, the new job yet, the promotion, more money, healing maybe, or happiness? Now as members of the family, as subjects of the kingdom, now we pray for the coming of the Father's kingdom, your kingdom come. We long for the heavenly city. I wonder how much that is true of us. Perhaps we're just a little too rich and comfortable in this present world, do we have a longing for heaven, for the coming of the kingdom? <clears throat> now those who are being persecuted or undergoing trial, pray wholeheartedly for the coming of the kingdom. So here we pray for the coming of the kingdom of God, when God, our Father, will be with men and will wipe every tear from their eyes. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter speaks of the day of the Lord and he asks, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless and at peace with him. This longing for the kingdom of God has an effect in the way we live. And Peter goes on to say, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. As we pray for the coming of of the kingdom, we realise that the days of grace in which we live, in which salvation can still be sought and found, those days are running out. This gives an urgency to our evangelism. We pray for the coming of the kingdom, but we also pray for opportunities to tell people the gospel. We pray urgently and persistently for our families, our friends and our neighbours, our work colleagues who don't yet know the gospel, who've not heard it who've not yet repented and turned to Christ. What a stimulus to holy living and evangelism this is. So our two primary concerns as Christians, the specialness of God's name and person, the coming of his kingdom. And then we pray for ourselves. In the version that uh, I was preaching from in the NIV, it just goes on from your kingdom come to give us day by day our daily bread. What's our greatest physical need? Give us this day our daily bread. 
you know, for the Jewish listeners to Jesus, the words daily bread would straight away take them back to that story of the manna in the desert, that God's provision for his people, 40 years, day by day, feeding them, that, that bread that came down from heaven. God directly sustaining his people for 40 years. And as we pray to our Father, we have that assurance that he hears and knows what we need before we ask him. And he can provide, and is willing to provide, but that we should still ask. And ask not in a greedy way, but just in asking for what is needful and good for us, trusting in his provision and thankful for his provision. And then what's our greatest spiritual need for forgiveness? For forgiveness from God, but also for forgiving others. Now this isn't about salvation, forgiveness, of, of becoming a Christian, of being born again. We've already talked about that, of being made a child of God. This is about dealing with our daily sin, of keeping short accounts with God, of facing up honestly each day to our faults and our failures, of confessing and being forgiven. In a sense, life in a family. Those niggles, those little resentments that just happen in family life, don't they? And then facing the challenge of forgiving those who sinned against us. Not just other Christians, but the boss who hasn't recognised our work, hasn't given us the promotion. The guy who thoughtlessly knocked into us in the street or cut in in the traffic jam. And we need to especially exercise all of this forgiveness and grace in our church relationships. And then finally in that, that version of Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. What's our biggest fear? What's our biggest fear? Lead us not into temptation. The Bible says that God our Father will not tempt us. But here we pray on Jesus' authority that God our Father would protect us and prevent us from being led into temptation. God will not tempt us, but are we good at leading ourselves into temptation? We know our weaknesses, so why do we do it? What are the things that will tempt us apart from ourselves? We've got those three, haven't we? Sin, the world, and the devil. But all of these prey on our weaknesses. Peter warns in 1 Peter chapter 5, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Paul commands Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he warns Timothy against one specific area of temptation. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. I wonder if you noticed in those passages, there was the fleeing on the one side <coughs> and the pursuing on the other. It's not just a negative, it's not just a resisting the devil, but it's also a standing firm. It's not just fleeing temptation, but it's pursuing righteousness, faith, love mm. and peace. So we pray that our Father wouldn't lead us into temptation but will deliver us from the evil one. We recognise our own weaknesses and we pray for strength and courage to resist the devil and flee temptation and then to stand firm and pursue holiness, righteousness, faith, love and peace. Then we have these two stories, these, these stories. I'm not going to attempt to even skim over those, so this is the homework. <coughs> To take what we've learned this morning and apply that learning to these stories. To look at them in that, that context of being children of the Father. And of asking, seeking, knocking, of being persistent in our prayer, 
being simple in our prayers, um, being um, having that expectancy and confidence as we come to the Father in our prayers. To think about these these sort of these parts of the passage in the light of what we said, in the light of that astounding miracle, that ridiculous, breathtaking audacity of that one word, Father. Amen. Perhaps we could just say the Lord's Prayer together. <coughs> You've got it open. Perhaps we've got different versions. Perhaps just follow as I read this version from our passage today. Let's pray it as a prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. We have our final song. I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this. Have we got a plan for this? The, the MP3 didn't work, so it's called Here is Love, Vast as the Ocean. I think it might be an a cappella solo by John. Yeah. Here is love, as as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life was handsome, shed for us his precious blood. Who is one who won't remember, who can cease to sing his praise? He can never be forgotten through our hands eternal days. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy, flood of vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers pour incessant from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kiss the guilty world in love.